Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Wendy Sachs, and I'm here from Plant Paro Plant Powered Metro New York. You'd think after all these years I'd be able to pronounce it. Plant Powered Metro New York. Um, welcome to our spring cooking show. Hard to believe we're already in April. Um, I'm happy to welcome you to our monthly series, Cooking with Chef Carol. And uh, this is a cooking show where Carol will demonstrate recipes without added salt, oil, or sugar, and she still makes them absolutely delicious. We are being co-sponsored today, not only by Plant Powered Metro New York, but by the JCC Manhattan Marlene, no, let's see, Marlene Meyerson Manhattan JCC. Yeah, JCC Manhattan. Hmm. It's one of those afternoons, I'm tumbling over my words. Um, so welcome to the JCC members, welcome to PPMNY members, and welcome to the all of you who are not yet members. Anyway, we're happy to have you. Plant Powered Metro New York empowers people to achieve better health and overcome chronic disease through a whole food, plant-based approach to nutrition. We offer evidence-based education, resources, and a grassroots network of support to create community and to inspire change. And together as leaders, organizers, and educators, we raise awareness about the dramatic benefits of whole food plant-based nutrition, empower individuals to make their own lifestyle adjustments, and lead projects that spark changes in food policy, food practice, and food culture. I have a few general announcements from the organization, and then we'll get right to Carol. So it's April. The farmer's markets are bursting with greens and greens and greens and all kinds of radishes and carrots and herbs, rutabaga, asparagus. And today, Carol is going to tantalize us with onions and asparagus and mushrooms and peas, all incredible seasonal vegetables for, um, for springtime. And a quick announcement on behalf of Plant Powered Metro, we have just celebrated our five-year anniversary. And as we move forward um, to realize our vision of, of communities free of illness and people living their best lives through a plant-based lifestyle, um, we are offering more in-person classes this month. And we still do have our online classes. And since it is an anniversary month, we are also encouraging those of you who um, enjoy the shows and enjoy the free education, if you'd like to donate, to please go ahead and donate because we have numerous things going on all over and um, this this is one, just one of them. Um, so this month, as I mentioned, we have a number of in-person events in New York City. Monday, April 15th, we have a Harlem movie night. We're showing Cowspiracy. The 18th, we're doing a show. Oh, wait, also on the 15th, we've got a plant-powered potluck in downtown Brooklyn. On the 18th, we have a Let's Go Shopping for Health at the Queens Public Library. This is um, the second of three series at the Queens Public Library. Um, plan on um, April 20th, we're doing um, a 5K walk all over in all the boroughs in Central Park in Manhattan, in Astoria Park in Queens, and in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. We don't have anything planned for Staten Island or the Bronx, so I guess just in three of the boroughs. April 29th, we have our Plant Powered Book Club discussing the China study. And then um, an online event I uh, really wanna urge you to participate in is a series called Nourish Your Mind. And on May 1st, it's meal prep and shopping for cognitive resilience. And this webinar is gonna cover the role of nutrition in preserving cognitive health and preventing some of uh, the top neurological conditions such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And as I said, it's online. It's at noon to one East Coast time. So highly recommend that. Um, go to our website to register or find out more details about all these events. And as usual, if you're shopping at the farmer's markets or even in the stores, we urge you to buy organic and even better. In fact, to, uh, last week for the first time, I found a regenerative bag of rice at our local supermarket. So that was cool. So even better, try to shop regeneratively um, farmed vegetables and ingredients. And... Um, 
Let's see, a couple guidelines. Uh, let us know where you're from in the chat. Also, please ask questions in the chat. Carol usually allows time during the demo, and if not, we try to save a few minutes at the end to answer as many questions as we can. And if you're enjoying the presentation, please like us on Facebook or on YouTube or even LinkedIn if you're watching from there. Okay, that's all quite a mouthful. Carol, what's on the menu today? Oh, Wendy, thanks for all that introduction and welcome. And I'm so excited because it's spring, right? It's starting to be spring. Maybe it's spring in your neighborhood, wherever you live. You're in California, you're on the West Coast. Maybe it's spring on the East Coast. I'm here in New Mexico in the mountains and we're starting to feel a little warmth. We're just starting, but no farmer's markets until the end of May. So, so um, still can be quite cold where I am, but I am able to find some asparagus and peas and radishes. And that's really what we're gonna to feature today. Although we are putting a lot of mushrooms in our tart. Um, I'm very excited about making everything. And let's just get going. Um, Wendy, I do want you to mention your fun fact from Dr. Oh, Furman about asparagus, because I thought yes. it was a great one. Carol and I um, share this wonderful book, 100 Best Foods. It's by Dr. Joel Furman. And I was looking up asparagus, just forgot to mention it. Asparagus has been hailed as a miracle vegetable since ancient times. The Greeks believed asparagus could cure a number of ailments from toothaches to heart disease. But uh, one thing that is important, I'll mention this here, um, asparagus provides more folate than any other vegetable. Only raw spinach or turnip greens have more. And in, in addition to its importance in fetal brain development, folate is essential throughout life. Um, and then Dr. Furman goes on to explain why. So 100 Best Foods, asparagus is in there. Enjoy today's uh, presentation. Okay, so we're going to start with the tart. And this, um, I'm all the time making quiches, you know, and I'm trying recipes all the time. And some quiches are made with chickpea flour. Some are made with tofu. And I ran into this recipe that really looked interesting to me because it harked back to my old days when I used to make quiche with pie crust and 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 um and eggs and i used to also make a rice crust and this particular recipe from a woman named helen dunn um she also made it with a rice crust and i thought that is awesome that someone else is doing that because i used to do that years and years ago and i kind of forgot that i knew how to do that so i actually took a little bit of her recipe and kind of melded in with some of my own ideas so i tribute it to her as being inspiration to my recipe um and we're going to get started it's going to have lots of mushrooms in it I've added asparagus. We're going to caramelize some onions first. So I do want to get started because there's a couple steps. It's not, none of it's hard. It's just steps and we try to do a lot of things. So I have a skillet here on the, and I've already been warming it up. I've preheated the oven to 350 degrees and I'm just going to see, did you all hear that? Did you hear that noise? Sizzle, sizzle. That means the pan is really hot and ready to go. I've taken one whole onion and I have julienned it. I left a quarter here just to show you that all you have to do is cut it thin. And this is going to be a layer in the tart uh, sitting on top of the, the uh, mushrooms. You'll see how it goes. And we've done this before. We have caramelized mushrooms. Some people can't believe it's possible without oil. But I have to tell you, it's really amazingly delicious. And I think the last time I caramelized onions, I told everyone that I love doing this and then putting some balsamic vinegar on them and putting them in the fridge and then just eating that on salads. Like I really like to do this process and caramelize them and then literally just toss it with a little balsamic vinegar and then put it away as like a condiment in a jar and have that for salads. So at this very second, there's no real water in the pan. And I have about a half a cup of water here. And I'm just gonna put a little water, not a lot. What I always say is when you're water sauteing and you're not using the oil, right? You don't wanna drown any 
vegetables or even these onions. You're not out to drown anything. You're basically steaming them at the moment and you're and and making sure that nothing is sticking. Okay, so those are gonna cook. Okay, that's what's that's what's gonna happen here. Those are gonna cook. In the meantime, what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch those carefully. And on my cutting board, I think I'll just move this out of the way for now so you can clearly, clearly see everything. Okay, on my cutting board, I have some fresh thyme that I have that we're gonna uh, saute the mushrooms in. And I have a little bit of fresh rosemary that I haven't quite chopped up. And I just say use one couple sprigs of thyme and a couple sprigs each of, ro of rosemary, okay? There's no exact amount, but this is gonna be flavoring our mushrooms, okay? And if you don't have the fresh herbs, of course I encourage you to get the fresh herbs. At this time of year when I don't have a garden and I don't have an abundant amount outside, um, I buy those little packages. In fact, I saved a package here for you so you could see their little half ounce packages of herbs. And we're going to use this later. We're going to use mint from one of these packages. And I've had thyme and rosemary in the refrigerator. These are things I just always have in my pantry because I love fresh herbs and you, they really make a difference. Now, of course, if you didn't have either one of these things, you could use Italian uh, seasoning, uh, a mixture of spices, you know, when they comes with rosemary and maybe it will have some marjoram and thyme in it. And that's okay. You just want to season your mushrooms when it's time to saute them. Okay, so we're going to put that over there for this very second. And we're going to move this because we're going to show you and we're, we really do have to keep our eye on these onions. And I can't forget about them. They're cooking away. I'm going to turn the heat up a little bit. And we're going to get the uh, pie plate out. And you can use any kind of pie plate you want. This one has always been kind of my, what I call my quiche pan, my tart pan. But if you have a fancier one, a ceramic one, anything will work. And earlier, I cooked uh, one cup of rice, brown rice. And I'm using the short grain rice. Um, the short grain rice has a little more stickiness, a little more starch to it, rather than you using the, the brown long grain rice. I have made a shell like this using the black rice, because that's also a short grain that has a little bit of stickiness to it. Um, you could use a sushi rice, that also would be fine, or a risotto would also be fine. But I made one cup of rice, and let's just get this rice out of this pan. And it's still kind of hot, I have to tell you. And so this is one cup of rice to two cups of water. And it looks like a lot of rice right at the moment, because I'm just piling it in. And it's still hot, okay? It's warm. It's been off the stove for at least a half an hour. But you kind of want it warm when you're doing this. You don't want it to be like cold in the fridge because I don't think it will be working as well. And I'm just going to start to kind of move it around and build it up on the sides. I'm going to get this rice off. And what I usually do is get either a piece of saran wrap, or I always have these old bags that I've got some vegetables in. And you're going to start to pat it, basically. And you're going to form it so that it's around the sides, <laughs> right? And you're basically making a pie crust. <laughs> you're not rolling anything. And you're making the sides. And you're trying to keep everything as even as possible. Now, if you had a little pastry roller, you could also use that in the center and kind of roll it. But you can see that I'm just moving it up the sides, right? You don't want it to go too, too far up the sides. And then I'm going to kind of pat the sides. Okay, and this is going to be our crust. So we're not having to make any kind of dough. And I'm just going to rinse this off for a minute. Hope it has rice. And I'm going to stir these onions. <laughs> and they're cooking away. Fine, they're not sticking. I don't have to add any water. And I use an electric burner here, and I'm not used to using an electric burner because I cook during the week on the big gas stove. I'm never quite sure how things are going to cook over here when we're in the demo. 
the things are cooking just fine. So we're just going to watch those. We can't forget about them. It's really important to kind of keep your eye on them, okay? And again, I'm just, everyone can see that I'm just kind of shaping this. And I'm really trying to find the sides of the pie pan, right? And you, you can feel where it's too thick or too thin. And I try not to get it over the edge too much. Like I try to kind of make it a little neat on the side so it's just not rising too high along the side. But it's, you don't have to be so, you know, careful with it. It's just, this looks pretty good. It really does. I'm going to just put my hand back in to feel it and kind of make sure the bottom is good. I just added, <laughs> I put the bag down on my cutting board. I ended up with a few spices. But that's basically our crust. Do you see that? I do see it. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Quick question, two quick questions actually, while you're talking about cooking the onions. Um, what kind of saute pan are you using? I knew somebody was gonna ask that, Wendy. And I, this particular one is an old favorite of mine. Um, it's really, it's, I treat it like a cast iron pan because it does need some seasoning and uh, it needs, it needs a little babying. I call it babying. It needs a little loving all the time to, to stay the way it is. It's called a debuyer. I think it's capital D E. And then I think it's literally B U Y E R buyer. I think pretty certain that is. Um, and it's just a, a nice cast out. It's a, it's a really good pan for searing. I think most people use it for searing meats, honestly. Um, but I tend to like it for, I don't know, cooking mushrooms and onions. I That's what I like it for. It's a cast iron, did you say? It's it a is. It's, it's not cast iron. It's, it is cast um, I wish I could just look it up. Maybe maybe Jim or somebody can look up the buyer. I think, I'm pretty sure it's cast iron, but it's not the kind of lodge cast iron. You know, right. not the kind that we're used to. Um, it is, I think it's, it's not, it's, it's pressed. There's, there, I'm sorry I don't know enough about it anymore because I just had it for so long I don't think about it. But maybe, maybe Jim could look it up by chance and he could put a little something up about it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it's D-E and then B-U-Y-E-R. The buyer. blue think. carbon steel, and, and someone from the audience also said carbon steel. So, but, but like I said, it's a, it's a little bit finicky of a pen, but I really love it. <laughs> now, right. I just want to show you what's happening here, right? Or you see how those are caramelizing? Yeah. If they're really getting brown, and we've added no oil. People think you need oil to do this, and you, it's so wrong. <laughs> it's, it's like we could make these really caramelized. What I'm going to do is pull them off a little, what I call ahead of time. I'm not going to kind of make them collapse all the way so that they're kind of just all relaxed, you know, like this. <laughs> they're going to be, they're going to be still a little bit crunchy is what I'm saying. Okay, they're not going to be totally soft. It's not that they're not going to be done. Do you see how wiggly they are? Right now, you hear a crunch, okay? For to make them kind of relaxed, you would cook them, you would continue to cook them. But I actually like them in this particular thing a little bit, a um, little bit, un, what I would call under, underdone. So in other words, they're caramelized, but they're not 100%. You could cook these for another five or 10 minutes to get them really, really soft. But these are gonna be good enough in less than seconds. You see, I just wanna show you how beautiful they are. Gorgeous. And, not, and they're not sticky. But I have been nursing them and putting a little, little bit of water. And that's what we do. That's what it means when we're water sauteing. Now, could you use broth? Of course you could if you had some broth you could use the broth in replace of water. That would just give it a little more, um, more flavor. And everyone can see the crust, right? It's really nice. You can see the bottom. It's all, and it's all evenly padded. It's a little thicker than what a pie crust would be. You know, when you're rolling pie crust, that's very thin. I would say the walls of this are probably a good almost quarter inch. Okay. Two questions. Is the quiche um, glass plate like that 
deeper than a pie plate or can you use no this is just a pie plate this is okay, just great. a pie plate it's nothing it's a pyrex it's like the cheapest thing you could actually own i Absolutely. mean and the brown rice can you use the brown rice um crust like that for pies like could you make a pumpkin pie or something would you well, use you it you know i've never made it? a pumpkin pie but you certainly could try i've always you know in the old days when i did this i always put quiche in it i oh that was kind of what i did because it was i was always trying to stay away from so much fat in the quiche so i would make this rice crust and again i would often make it with black rice that works just as good as the brown rice and probably red rice probably works as well. I just don't, you want the stickier rice. <laughs> and that's why I'm saying that you want the short grain rice, okay? I hope that answers the question, Wendy. Yep, all done. So I'm gonna take these out now, okay? And I'm putting just a hair of water because I have just a very few little pieces of julienne onion that are just wanting to be obstinate. And I'm just going to literally take these out and we're going to put them aside. Okay, so we basically have, I would say almost, it looks like a cup and a half of, of onions. Okay, it's a lot of onions. But you can see why if you took these and put a little balsamic vinegar away on them, let them cool, and then put them in a jar, they are out of this world on a green salad. Okay. They will change your life. They will change the game. You know how sometimes when you eat things and you're like, oh, that's really, a you know, that really changes things up. That really, you know, I sometimes put dukkha on my salad. I'm like, wow, that really changed the salad up, like with so little effort. This is one of those things that can really change up the salad, okay? Now we're gonna move on to the next step, okay? We have to keep going. We have the hot pan. We have a little bit of water. The pan is very hot. And I'm going to start to put the mushrooms in. We have so many mushrooms. We have a pound and a half of mushrooms. And what kind of mushrooms do I have today? I actually have white button mushrooms. I have cremini and I have shiitake. Okay. If you just use one kind, that's just fine. Okay. And if you don't have a pound and a half and you have just a little over a pound, that's fine too. Okay. So, but a pound and a half, you want have a lot of mushrooms. Now, I was going to probably save some of those mushrooms and let some cook down, but because I was talking to you all, I ended up putting them all into the, it all in at one time. And I want to show you that with the shiitake mushrooms, I'm not sure if all of you know this, but you want to really take off this little stem. So I saved this one and you just want to either pull it out, right? And I throw this into my either compost or I put it into my Ziploc bag that has um, all the stuff for broth. And I just put these stems into the, to the freezer bag to make stock, okay? So I don't really throw them out, but these are a little woodsy. We're going to talk about the ends of the asparagus also being a little woodsy, but shiitake mushrooms, their stems are a little woodsy. So you definitely want to get rid of that. And I'm just going to show you that once you get rid of that stem, then of course you cut that and you want to put that in here. Now once these start to cook down a little bit, and we're going to put a little water in here, just like we did with the onions. Not a lot, but we need these onions to really, I mean these mushrooms, to really cook down. And I could, once these cook down, I probably could eat the whole pot, almost. I love mushrooms, they're like my favorite thing. And they're really good for your immune system. I, I, I know we're, we're a little bit away, so, you know, we don't talk about the pandemic so much, but I was a hoarder of mushrooms during that time. I, I would buy even the frozen ones at the Trader Joe's and just throw them in my freezer because they have a, the wild mushrooms. This would work for that too. The wild mushroom bag from Trader Joe's, which is made up of lots of kinds of mushrooms, you could buy a couple bags of those, get your pound and a half, and just throw them right from the freezer right into here. And then you won't have to cut anything. I mean, Carol, that's... you're you never admitted to me you were the mushroom hoarder. I went I am, over, I was, and over and I was. over again and I couldn't find mushrooms. I was because I was afraid to get sick and I thought if I'm gonna eat anything, I better eat the mushrooms because they said they had built the immunity, right? And I was I just 
I, I think I ate like two cups a day of mushrooms. It was like taking vitamins or something. I, I looked at it like I had to have these. Oh, and the other thing I left out to remember, I don't know if many of you know this, but I try to buy my mushrooms where you can pick them out of a bin and then put them into a bag. And maybe where your local market is, they offer a brown bag. Um, I've never understood why mushrooms come in a plastic container and then they put saran wrap over them because they just build up with moisture. And so really, ideally, I mean, if you're going to the farmer's market and buying, they actually do sell them to you in a brown bag. And I literally put this brown bag into the refrigerator and that's how I store the mushrooms because they stay the longest this way and they tend not to get all mo too much moisture. And if anything happens to them in the fridge because you've pushed them to the back or you've forgotten them, God forbid, you can find them, you'll open them up and you'll say, oh my God, they've all shriveled up. That's the worst thing that could happen to them. They'll, they'll sh the moisture will come out and they will get dried in this bag. And that's not a bad thing either because I've cut those up and used them too because they're essentially dried mushrooms, right? Better than having them in a plastic bag or, or a plastic container where moisture is building up, okay? So I left this out and I use this bag like 50, 15 times at the store. I keep just putting it back into my, my bag of things and, and yeah. So now what's happening here is I don't have to add any more water so that these don't stick because the, the, I have it at a high heat. It's really good to cook the mushrooms at a really, like here on an electric burner, it's like at four or five. If you were on a gas stove, you would want to have the flame large because the higher it is, you're really trying to sear them and make the mushrooms so that they are releasing their juices, but also having all their flavor. So what we're going to do right now, well, you can see that I had a mountain of them and now I don't, well, I still have a lot, but I have a but they're not falling out of the pan and they're cooking, the water's cooking up. I'm gonna add the spices that I cut up, okay? We're gonna get those added right now and just, just get that thought, all in there. I just thought I'd mention in terms of mushrooms, also from uh, Furman's book, and in terms of keeping them in the fridge too long, he says that, you know, these are all ancient foods, onions and mushrooms, they've all been used in prehistoric times, but with mushrooms, he says, even Otzi the Iceman, the 5,300 year old frozen mummy found in Europe in 1991, was carrying dried mushrooms with him when he died. Oh my gosh. Go figure. So they've lasted at least 5,300 years. It's incredible. And I'm realizing that I forgot to get something out of the cabinet, so I'm getting that out. Um, um, that's amazing, Wendy. Yep. And some people drink mushroom coffee, right? You were drinking that for a little while. I don't know if you still do. No. But but mushrooms have a lot of purposes, right? So these look delicious. They smell phenomenal. The other thing you could do if you didn't have the fresh rosemary and the fresh thyme, I told you you could use Italian seasoning. You could also use... Uh, um, a little bit of sage, a little bit of thyme, a little oregano. You just want to flavor the mushrooms, okay? And then I'm going to give it a few turns of fresh black pepper because you have to have black pepper in your mushrooms, okay? And these are really super, super sizzling. And I'm going to, in a minute, get them out of this pan. But before we get them out of the pan, um, I'm trying to get all the liquid absorbed. I want the pan to be dried, and then we're going to deglaze the pan with a little bit of, uh, what is it, one-fourth cup, actually. I just want to get that out here, and just let me get the one mushroom out of here. Um, one-fourth cup. I have cooking sherry, and we've used this before. It does burn off. I know some of you don't want to use any alcohol in the product, and... I have to read all the things that are in here, but it's just one fourth cup. You could use white wine or honestly, you don't have to use anything. Okay. I should have put optional. Okay. But it gives the mushrooms share. You could use a little sherry vinegar. 
If you didn't want to use the cooking wine, you could use sherry vinegar, which is one of my favorite vinegars. Sherry and mushrooms are like a heaven, like married and then gone to heaven. So you really want those things. So this pan is almost dry. It has a little more liquid here, just a hair more. And we're going up, oh, they're starting to lose their liquid. And how can I tell them? Because they're gonna to want to almost stick to the bottom. I see just a very few mushrooms that want to stick to the bottom. And what I'm gonna do is literally pour that over and let that sizzle for a saute for just a minute. And of course, how can you not eat a mushroom? Uh, oh my God, just this. We could make dinner on just this. Okay, and then I'm gonna put the mushrooms when we take, we already have our bowl of onions. And I'm gonna turn this off and I'm going to put this into the big bowl, okay? And we only have a few little mushrooms that have stuck to this pan, not too many. And I could deglaze the pan a little more, but I wanna just show you the pan so you see. Just one or two mushrooms are here stuck to the pan, but not so much. Actually, pretty good. I'm going to put this in the back so it's not in our way. I feel good about that. And look at that, how delicious. So that's going to just kind of cool off for now. We're going to move this. And let's just talk about the asparagus now. So we have the asparagus, and there are lots of theories about asparagus that most people take the easy route out. And that's usually when I'm in a hurry, what I do actually. Um, asparagus have what they call the woodsy end. <laughs> and this is the part like, if you didn't know this and you were just to cook your asparagus, you would get down to the bottom and you'd, go, <laughs> and you'd be like chewing, 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 wondering why you're not like breaking it apart because it's woodsy, it's woodsy. It's just like the stem of the shiitake. So most people just cut this off. Now this I do all the time, right? especially if I'm making asparagus soup. If I'm making asparagus soup, I save these and I would boil them with the vegetable broth and I would use these as broth, okay? But today, or the theory is, if you don't want to do that, you would take a peeler, right? And you would just peel the bottom like this amount, which I'm gonna say is two inches. Every asparagus is a little bit different on the length. And you would just peel down, and I could get a peeler just to show you this, just really fast. But by peeling it, you would get rid of that woodsy stuff. Okay, so this is if you were trying to serve, oopsie, I just broke it, so that's not very good. But if you were trying to serve a big plate full of beautiful asparagus, you would just peel these ends like this, and that would be good enough. And then you're not throwing away part of the asparagus, right? You're just gonna have that like that. And the woodsy part, the yucky part would all be gone. Okay, so I've showed you that, and that's why I left some of that. And what I'm gonna do is I've already taken the asparagus. They're not cooked. We're gonna put them right into the pan. And what I did was I take one, I know this is in the way, I can see that it's in the way, but we need that very close by, but we'll just put it here for now. I took the asparagus and I actually cut it kind of in half, and then I split the, this, the beautiful tops, the little, their little tops. I've split it so it's in half, okay? Why have I bothered to do that? Because I think because we're not cooking them and we're just putting them in on the top for almost decoration. And then I take the bottom and I cut them into smaller pieces. I split them. And those are actually going to go at the bottom of our quiche, uh, our quiche tart, whatever I want to call it here. Um, it doesn't matter so much that they're at the bottom. It's just that what I ended up at the first time I made this, I just put them on the top and I thought, and then I was left over with a bunch of bottoms and I ended up cooking them, but I thought, let's try to use as much as possible. Um, I didn't use the whole pound of asparagus. I have 
this amount left. Um, again, it depends on how fat they are, how skinny. Sometimes you buy the pencil uh, asparagus and they're very thin and you would need to cut them down the middle. These are fat asparagus, okay? And we're gonna take this crust here and so that I don't forget my idea of putting some at the bottom, right? Just, just layering some so that we have that at the bottom. Not, and not so many, not just a few, just to cover the bottom. And that's just an idea, okay? That's gonna go there. I didn't even use them all, you see? Now we have to make the filling. And let's do that. We're gonna make it in a blender. You don't need a high powered blender, but you need some kind of blender. You could do it in a food processor, that would work too. But I'm gonna do it in a blender. I'm gonna take this away. And let's think about what's going in here. So we're gonna use tofu, and this is extra firm tofu. And you see me use a lot of tofu here. Most of the time I press it in a, a machine that takes all the water out. Here I just opened the top and I drained it. I did not press it at all, but I did press it a little bit just to get some of the water out. And I buy this Wildwood brand that comes in a double package that comes in two, because I'm a single person and I like that I can eat a half a pound at one time. And this is only calling for seven ounces and it's 15 and a half when you buy the double. You pay a little more to buy the double than a big block of tofu, but I like that I you know, don't have to worry about it. I don't know, just nice for a single portion to be in there. So I'm gonna put that big chunk right in there that technically gets thrown away. And then we're going to add to this one cup of plant-based milk. You can have any kind of milk, almond milk, oat milk, soy milk. One cup of milk is going in there. And we'll take that and put that there. And then we're going to add other things. We're going to add, and I'm going to try to do it in the right order. One fourth cup of arrowroot or tapioca flour. So that's kind of a lot, but that's what's going to hold it together. It's good. And then we're going to add a one-fourth teaspoon of turmeric and two teaspoons of onion powder. So that's going in there like that. And then we have two teaspoons of low-sodium tamari. Okay, and sometimes people ask me which one I use. Um, I know they're making another kind now. This I've had for a little while, but this is the Sanjay, Sanjay, 28% less sodium tamari soy sauce. They're making one now that is 50% less, so they're calling it light, and it's got a little green circle. So look for that. I'll buy that the next time. And we need some freshly ground pepper, eventually, and I'm just going to put it in while I'm remembering, and we're going to put that in here. And then we're going to blend this up. Now remember, I have the oven already on uh, 350 degrees. I did not make one of these in advance because I thought, what will I do with two? It takes me four days to five days to get through one. So we're going to, I don't know if we'll have it totally finished, but we're going to blend this. <laughs> seconds actually okay and what we're going to do is we're going to take half of this so I, I'm not going to bother measuring it I just know about half I'm just going to estimate half that is half right there uh, there are measurements here lines I kind of just looked and we're going to toss this on the mushrooms okay we're just okay this is going to be the base and we're going to secretly have the little asparagus underneath. And that's going to go in here like that. And I know you're not seeing me pour it because I have the bowl facing, but that's going to go in there all like that. Okay. And I do want to get those all kind of flat. It's almost to the top. It's really full. And I want to get a spatula and get all this out. I don't know. And then what we're going to do next, and you see it's almost to the top. You think, how is everything gonna fit? You wonder about that some moments. 
And you, the next thing we're doing is we're going to put our wonderful, beautiful onions on the top, right? On the top like that. We're just literally making like a bed of them. You can see <laughs> I'm like salivating at the moment because it's so beautiful already and it hasn't even gone into the oven. And it's got these onions, a layer of onions. I'm just going to kind of pat it down so that it's even. Now we're really at the top. <laughs> we really are super at the top. I don't know how we got to be at the top. So that didn't happen to me the last time. We weren't so close to the top. Maybe my rice puffed up more this time. I'm not sure. I cooked the same amount of rice as I did before. But Okay, and then this rest of this filling, we're going to carefully pour on top, okay? And I'm really going to be careful about this because I'm so close to being on the top that I don't want to overflow. And if anything, maybe I won't use all of this topping today because we're so close to the top. And I'll just save it and I'll make a little a little tiny pie or something. I don't know. I'll do something with it if we don't use it all. But we do want to cover it all. And then this is going to go in the 350 degree oven and cook for almost at least 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes. It just depends on how hot your oven is. Okay. And you really want this to be covered. Okay. Like this. You see, I kind of did want to overflow it, kind of patting it down. And you see, it's really got a lot. Now, I have just a little teeny bit left over, probably a half a cup. Again, I think like the first time I did it, I don't think my rice puffed up as much. Now, it's really up to you how you want to do this. I know it doesn't look great on the camera at the moment because anything that's yellow never shows up really beautifully. But it's up to you how you want to deal with your pretty top you could cut it so put it so last time I put it all in a row like a pretty row now I think I'm going to make like a star of asparagus so that when I cut the actual pie everyone's going to get an asparagus top and uh, maybe two or three they're going to get I'm first going to just divide it like that and then I'm going to try to add some more <laughs> and I'm pushing them down and trying to they're not going to be cold they're still going to be rising above <laughs> the the top <laughs> but they're looking it's looking really good and I'm just you can see you can free form this any way you want now if you're having ideas of your own and say you know I don't like asparagus uh, I prefer to use broccoli. You could use broccoli. I'm just using asparagus because it is springtime and I just think it's so beautiful, right? Such a beautiful vegetable <laughs> and we don't get it all year round <laughs> and it's just so nice. You could decorate it with some tomatoes. <laughs> it's up to you. And then I thought we might have room for these little pieces, but we really don't. So I'm going to get a sheet pan. I wasn't planning on getting a sheet pan. But I am going oh, to get a sheet pad only because I'm starting to overflow the top and that worries me. So I'm going to just put it on. In fact, what I'll do is if you are not so rushed is I'm going to get a piece of parchment. That way if it overflows just a little bit, if it overflows a little, then I'm not getting it on my cleanup will be easy. Okay, so this is, I can't move it really. But you can pretty much see it, right, Wendy? You guys, you everyone can see that it's very pretty. I can't really lean it forward because we don't want to lose the liquid. And this is going to go in the oven, 350 degrees. It looks absolutely beautiful, Carol. And you're getting even a comment in the chat that uh, it looks amazing, and it does. And the decoration is just lovely. Yeah, and you can play with it yourself. Like I said, the first time I made vertical lines with the asparagus, and then when I went to cut the little, you know, the pie, I realized, oh, someone's getting a top and someone's getting a stem. Like, so I think this way kind of works out a little better because it's going out like a star, and it will be better when I cut, I think. So that that was the reasoning for doing it that way this time. And this might I mean, be you have to be, but how many people will that serve? Um, well, I think, you know, I don't write the servings often on the recipes, Wendy, because, you know, 
like salad, sometimes a serving for a person is this much, but you'll see when we make this pea salad, I ate half of it the other day in one go, go around, mm -hmm. right? So I think you could at least get eight, six to eight pieces out of that pie, right? Mm -hmm depending on if it's your main course, you know, or you're serving it as a little bit of a side, but I ate this salad and that, and I think eight pieces would be about right. It Unless looks, you're snacking on it a little bit, which I definitely, I did that too. During the week, I would go to the fridge and I would just cut a little piece. So I don't know, you'll figure it out. I, I, I always hesitate about the servings because I'm never sure with this when since I became plant based, I really feel like I eat so much more than what is considered to be a normal person sometimes. <laughs> um, I understand. I Any questions while before we tra transition to the next thing? Honestly, I think we're all riveted, so there's no questions, and you can move on. And I'm looking at the clock and. The, the, it will not be fully done when we're, when we're signing off, but I will show it to you. And what will be important, and I just want to remember this now, is when you take it out, you do want it to cool down. The, it will be warm when you serve it, okay? But you don't want to just dive into it the minute it comes out of the oven because it will cut much better into real slices if you let it, let it do its cooling down, okay? So we must remember that little tidbit, okay? That's important. Now let's make the salad and let's just see if I can, you know, I'm going to, we'll do this over here. We'll try to do it here. And I'm gonna put this, I have a pot of water here and it's gonna hopefully boil in like minutes, hopefully, while I talk about peas. And let me just wipe the counter, because I can't work. Very hard to work when it's dirty. So this recipe is kind of uh, my own inspiration because I love these things together. And they are the first things that you do think about in springtime, peas and mint and, and radishes. Those are the things you think about. Um, one of my favorite things to do with peas, and you can do it with frozen peas, you don't have to have fresh peas, but um, there's a pea hummus that I love making with mint. I, I believe it's on my website, if anybody was curious. Uh, we made it a long time ago, one of the first things we did on this, on this show. So let me get rid of more things so we're just not as crowded as we need to be here. And you know what, I still have asparagus on the cutting board. That was really fun to make, Wendy. That I feel really, I, I feel like I'm a sense of accomplishment when I make that that tart. It looks you know? absolutely beautiful. And um, you know, as I'm thinking about the upcoming Jewish holiday of Passover, I had a different dish in mind, but I'm beginning to think maybe I'm gonna make that and serve that for my my. I have a very small group coming, so. Um, that could so that's an idea. Positive. You know, I don't want to get into a whole Passover conversation because it will just get me started. But everybody thinks about what is what is the right grains for Passover, right? And over the years, they've changed. And if you're Ashkenazi and you're European, you don't eat the chickpeas and you don't eat the rice and you don't. But the Sephardic. They do. They, 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 there's, there's a little more leeway in, in, the, in the beans and the grains. Now, my approach has always been that I'm both. I'm Ashkenazi and I'm Sephardic. And I also believe that I'm, uh, for years and years before I even became a vegan, I was vegetarian. And I thought, you know what? I survive on beans and grains, so I'm going to eat them during Passover. I don't take them away from myself. Other people are much more strict, and, and I know that quinoa has been recently, in the last few years, been kind of an approved uh, grain to, to have. Um, so everyone's different, but it is a good idea. It would work perfectly for, for Passover, Wendy. And you do have a viewer who's asking if she can come over for dinner. Oh, I would love that because I just ate all this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm not so excited about eating it again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but I'd be happy anybody could come over, especially if you're living close by. So let's get started. And I want to show you 
a couple things. While this water, it's going to boil. Amazing. It's little boil. It's little it's little bubbles are starting, so I'm very happy about that. We have a big pile of arugula here, and I just realized I want a bowl. And so we're going to have a bowl. So what is going to go in this salad, and I should really look at it more carefully and not just make it up in my head, um, uh, is we're going to have lots of arugula. Okay, this is the arugula. I've already washed it. It's little, uh, I don't know if it's baby arugula, but it's a smaller arugula than I normally have, I guess. So I'm going to call it baby arugula. We are going to use snap peas and snow peas. And both peas are nutritionally the same, okay? <laughs> what is the difference between a snap pea and a snow pea is very thin. Do you, can you see that? Yep. It has premature little tiny peas inside. And can you eat it raw? Absolutely. You can eat it raw and it's okay. Snap peas are fatter, okay? They also are, they're not flat, they're a little fatter and they have bigger peas inside, okay? They're almost, just, they can be interchangeable. Some it calls for snow peas and you only have snap. Doesn't matter, okay? I like to show you both today, and I have eight ounces here of snap and snow peas. I want to show you that on both kinds of peas, they have what you call a seam and a back. And you take, see, this is how they're hanging on their little bread on their little they grow on a stem and lots of them are hanging off you and then you they're like they're like green beans just that's how they grow you want to take this little part and you want to pull the seam off okay can you see that i'm pulling it's like a string yep okay? I can see it. and if you don't you really want to do that with both kinds okay you just take it and run it along its back and take off its stem. Now, what if you say I didn't do that and I just ate it? It's okay. <laughs> it really is. It's just like the asparagus. You might get to the bottom and say, I'm chewing, chewing, and it's not breaking it down. And it's because maybe you didn't take the seam off and you end up chewing the seam. But honestly, there have been plenty of times when I've just gotten peas at the farmer's market put them in my bag, got on the subway in New York when I lived there, and I would have no peas by the time I got home. Why? Because I will have eaten all the peas. Um, and they're so good when you can buy them fresh. I mean, they are just so, they're so sweet. They're like candy, okay? So do try to, de what I call, de seam them, seam. They have the seam. And if you don't do it, it's okay. Um, the other thing I showed if those of you that have the recipes at my store this week, I looked at these peas and I said, what are these? Are they spoiled? Are they, why are they black? Why are, why are they looking like this? Do you know, like, look at what they look like. I thought, what's wrong with those? Are they, and then I looked at the sign where they were selling them and they were purple snow peas. And I was like, wow, I've never seen purple snow peas. Now, of course, when I went to go get more, they were all gone. And I don't know when they'll be back because we're still in the colder, you know, I think it's a rarity. Some local farmer probably brought in a bag full of them and they disappeared. But I just wanted to show you that there's a, such a thing that's called purple snow peas. And for me, it was so special. And do they taste the same? They certainly do. But when you're talking about salad, they look really beautiful because you're adding color, right? And we try to eat the rainbow. So that is ultimate to have those. That's if you can. But it's only just like a surprise. Even all the years we lived in New York at the, and benefited from the Union Square Market, I never saw purple snow peas. No, me neither. It's a thing, you know? Super it's lovely. A thing. So these peas are boiling, the water is boiling rapidly. It probably doesn't need to be so rapid, I realize, but I really want it to be rapidly cooking, I guess. And we're gonna blanch these in like 30 seconds, okay? 30 seconds. And again, I told you, you can eat them raw, but what we want, our goal is to get them bright green. Right now they're dull green, and them going into this pot, this, going into this pot, and literally what's gonna happen 
is they're going to turn bright green and then we're going to take them out of the pot. I'm getting asparagus on my arm and we're just going to stir these around for a moment. And they cook in, in 30 seconds. Maybe somebody would tell you it's a minute or two, but I'm going to tell you the minute they're bright green, they're done. You just want to blanch them. And if you're doing this properly, uh, I didn't get any ice out, but what you're going to do is you're going to drain them in this colander. First, you're going to turn off the burner. You're going to be smart about this. And then you're going to drain them. You're going to get rid of all that nice water. Now, if it was garden time, I think I would collect that water and it would for sure be in the garden. Let's get rid of this pan here. And what I'm going to do, because I don't want to waste the time of getting ice cubes, you basically want to run this under cold water now. And the ice cubes are better because it shocks them and it will get them cooled down immediately. But they're cooling right this very minute. They're cooling perfectly. And, and can, I don't know if you can see, I'm gonna try not to make a watery mess, but can you see that they're bright green now? They really have changed, okay? They're, they're way brighter than before. I know you can't see that on the camera, but- We can. You can? Yeah, it's just lovely. Yeah, they're they look a little green. more um, puffed up and just beautiful. The color. Yeah, and they're, and this is one you know you can barely. You're lucky you get them to the bowl that they're supposed to be in. I'm telling you, I I used to eat them all the way home on the subway and they would be gone. So I always buy more. So we're I'm gonna move this just a little so you can see what I'm up to here. Just make sure. These are too big for the salad, okay? Maybe if you're eating a Chinese meal or something and you're sitting there with a fork and a knife, and I guess with the salad, you can also sit there with a fork and a knife, but I'm gonna cut everything in half, just so that they're bite-sized and so that when you're tossing the salad, they kind of move through the entire salad. And so I'm just literally taking a knife and cutting them in half. If you wanna get fancy, you could cut them on an angle. That would be fine too like this, cut them on an angle, and right? And then, you don't have so many to cut, but they're awfully beautiful, they're so beautiful. I mean, I'm not kidding you, you can never have enough snap peas. And it's something that you don't, you really only have in the springtime. And so get your fill of them now. And they're a good snack to have on the cap counter, I think. <laughs> did the purple um, get more purpley, Carol, or did they go green? Oh, no, you know, I didn't, I, I, I have one, I seem to have only cooked one, purple one, but the purple um, stays, it stays. See? Oh, cool. It, it's not like a bean, you know, sometimes when you have a beautiful heirloom bean and it's yeah. purple and white and then you look in the pot and they're all brown and yeah. you're disappointed that they're still not purple and white, these actually stay purple. I, and that's why I thought they were so beautiful. So I'm gonna just throw another one or two in just for prettiness even though they're not blanched. But those are, okay, so that's, that, that is though, that is these. And I'm gonna just get a paper towel. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put them on the towel. Well, I'm gonna put them back in here to tell you the truth. I just gonna put them back in here. And you really want these to be dry, okay? Um, you don't ever want to add water to your salad. That's a really important thing. I always see people just wash salad and then they don't spin it or they don't dry it. And, and then there's a puddle of water at the bottom and it's, it's, you, you're just basically diluting all the flavor, right? So you just want that to really be dry. So we're going to leave those right there for now. We're going to move these. These were our ones that we were showing. And I have three-fourths cup of radishes. And what did I do to get these sliced radishes? They're, these are just red radishes. Hopefully, where you live, you can get purple ones and pink ones and uh, breakfast radishes. I mean, there's such an endless amount of radishes. Get any kind, get colorful ones. When I grow them in the garden, I grow the purple and the red and the, uh, there's like so many, there's a variety. And they all do taste a little bit different. Some are spicier than others. But you can, if you have a mandolin, you're all fancy, you wanna slice them that way, you can. I think it's faster just to do it by hand like we just did. And you want to slice them as thin as possible, right? You almost wanna see through, see through them, right? 
um, I have so many right here, three-fourths of a cup, okay? That's going to go into our salad. And I have a lot of mint here. I probably have too much mint, so let's just get one pile of it here. And that's going to go into our salad. And ultimately, we want one-third of a cup of chopped mint. Now, mint is not as delicate as basil. <laughs> basil is something that you want to tear and shift, make nice chiffonade cuts because it's a very delicate. Um, mint is a, a little sturdier, so you can give it some quite a bit of chopping. And we're going to chop, and I want to have almost one third of a cup. So I'm, I think we just, I'm gonna try to use as much as this as possible. You know, where I live, they don't sell mint, like, unless it's in those plastic, you know, in Fairway, you can buy a big, like, bouquet, like, walk out of there with a bouquet of, of uh, mint, and I love that. Um, until I have it in my garden, I won't have a lot. I can only get it in those tiny little packages, and I always feel cheated, because mint grows like a weed, and it just proliferates. It's, it's one of those things that... I don't know. You can never have enough mint as far as it's I'm concerned. True. It also tastes so much better when you're getting it from the farmer for, rather than in those packets. In the wintertime here, you have to use those packets, and they just don't taste the same as what oh it's Oh, my God. Like. And if you only could just smell this right now. Oh. It's, it's, like, it's, like, it's like aromatherapy if you were at the spa or something. Like It's like, it's like really so fragrant. And these are the kinds of things that really change, like I said, they're real changers in your salad because we're not using the salt, we're not using the oil. And those kinds of things, as we've discussed before, kind of mask, kind of take away the actual flavor. So when someone's going to eat the salad for the first time, they're going to say, wow, it's bursting with flavor. Well, it's bursting with flavor because it's not being covered by salt and oil and any other, it's, it's, it's the thing itself. <laughs> and I, I cannot tell you how, you, this is a step you would not want to miss, right? Of cutting the fresh herb because, and if you wanted, you could put a little lemon zest if you wanted, but it doesn't really need it. It just, this amount of fresh herb, we want one third of a cup, and I'm just going to measure it up to, I do want to have enough. And I, I realized the other day one third of a cup was the right when I was writing up the recipe. And look at that. We have one third of a cup. Perfect. Awesome. So, so that's good. So now we're pretty much ready to put the salad together. Let's just move. So what we're going to do in a big bowl, this isn't our presentation bowl. This is just our mixing bowl. We're going to move this and move this. And we're going to, ah, we're going to rough chop this arugula. I kind of have it all over the counter. I washed it a few hours ago. And again, we're just kind of chopping it. And that's going to go in there, right? This is a really fast salad. Now, it's best served fresh the day that you make it. I had just a teeny bit little left over, and I did eat it the next day. And the, the it was just delicious the next day, but the snow peas were no longer bright green anymore. They were, like, kind of light brown because uh, they oxidized. But that's okay. They were still delicious. So this is a salad that if you're just a single person and you want to make a little less, it's up to you, right? I'm just giving you a mouse just so you see what it's like the way I intend it. But you want to have more peas and less arugula, it's all fine. Do it your own way, okay? Really, that's okay. You have to, this is just a guide. I give you the recipe and the idea to get started and then, and then you go from there. Okay, and we need, uh, we have our radishes at the bottom. So I kind of, and then I'm going to put the mint, right? And that goes there. And I'm just going to give all this a good tossing just now. Oh my gosh, it just is, it's like every smell is pot smelling. Arugula smelling, mint smelling. Uh, so this is what this looks like. Just, Beautiful. just like that. Okay, now we're going to make our very fast dressing. And I'm going to move these things. Just want to move everything so that you're not. And it's good to look in the oven to see what's happening. Hello? 
Okay, things are cooking. <laughs> it's cooking. It's not going to be done in time for us, but like I said, I didn't really want to make one ahead because I just finished one and I thought I can have two two tarts in the house I, and I just felt like how many times can I make this? So Girl, it's did, okay. You're the did the you'll tarts see it when it's almost done. Did the tarts um, and, respond when you said hello? Pardon? Did the tart respond when you said hello? Oh, it said it said hello back. I it did. I, I just I just always like checking things in the oven. I love to make cooperate. So okay, so we're going to make the dressing, and this is the, the simplest dressing ever. And I know many of you have heard this before, but when Wendy and I first started, when I first started, we were friends, and I was going into this direction of no oil, no sugar, no salt. I'm like. Dressing without the oil was really hard for me. It was really like a concept that was like, because the fastest thing to do is to go to your cabinet and pour the oil and the a lemon and then it's done. But once I learned actually this Dr. Furman recipe that was raspberry dressing with apples and vinegar and dates and it was so yummy that I was like, okay, I if I'm going to have a salad, the dressing always has to be in the refrigerator. It just has to be there ready for me to go because then I'll make a salad and it'll be just like reaching into my cabinet. It will just be available. So that's kind of my number one rule is some kind of dressing has to be in the refrigerator for me. Any kind, doesn't matter what it is, but it has to be there. Okay. And that's, that's my workaround for uh, grabbing what used to be so simple, the olive oil right out of the cabinet. So this is a different kind of fruit dressing. It's not the raspberry dressing. I'm going to make it in the Nutribullet. I'm just going to kind of pull this over here. And this recipe is super simple. Okay, we want a half a cup, a heaping half a cup of fruit. Now, I had cherries. I always have cherries in the freezer. That's just something that just is part of my pantry is cherries. And I know that's true for Wendy too, because we used to make cherry and chocolate snack all the, all the time after dinner. We had banana and cherries and we made a chocolate ice cream. So I know she has cherries too. So I do. Um, sometimes when strawberries are on sale at this market, I buy like many baskets of them and then I just slice them up and throw them in the freezer so, and put them in a Ziploc bag. So you could use frozen cherries. These cherries were frozen this morning and these cherries. Eh. So basically I have a mixture here of cherries and strawberries. Okay. Does it matter what kind? Could it be all strawberries? Of course. Could it be half? all cherries of course but it's super fun to mix the cherries and the strawberries okay so i'm going to put that in the container and i think i'm going to add one or two more strawberries i felt like i had more cherries okay so that's just what i have left those were all frozen just a, a little bit ago well and and inside this uh container i had already measured out two teaspoons of dijon and I put in one medjool date, just one. One is plenty because it's going to act as a sweetener. The fruit is already sweet, so one is plenty. Now we're going, and we have the um, uh, mustard, so that's going to give us our tang. And then we need a little bit of vinegar. Now what I'm going to show you is I'm going to use two kinds of vinegar. Uh, you could you, ultimately we need a half a cup of vinegar, but I'm going to use a quarter cup and let me just find what I prefer better is this. I prefer the glass measure. So just let me rinse it out. Let me just rinse it out. Um, why am I using two kinds of vinegar? Well, because the balsamic vinegar can be very sweet, right? And I don't want it very sweet because I've already put in fruit and I've already put in um, a date. And a bals if it was all half a cup of balsamic, so I'm using a white wine vinegar and a balsamic. So, and I like the white wine because it's a little sharp. 
okay? So the combination of these two things are really nice. Now, if you happen to have a pantry that just has white balsamic, that probably would work too, okay? If you have the white balsamic, because white balsamic is not as sweet as the, as the dark. So I'm gonna use a quarter cup of the dark balsamic. This is not, I have another um, bottle in my cabinet of the fancier stuff made by the same people, made by Napa Valley. That's the reserved, which is very thick, like a syrup. And that's a very good one. But this one's just the regular balsamic. And then I'm gonna use a half, another quarter cup of this white. Okay, and we're just adding. So we have a total of a half a cup. Okay, and it looks like I'm almost gonna finish the jar. I am gonna finish. I might as well just get it all in there. Less the bubbles, but that's that. That's the end of that. Vinegar is like a weapon to me, right? If you have good vinegar, you've got your salad, right? You can order from California Balsamic. There's other ones, other really good vinegar places. Uh, sometimes you have to go to the olive oil store to find the good vinegars, but having a good vinegar is everything. And speaking of Dr. Furman, you had given me such a nice gift, Wendy, when I moved here of like 12 little bottles of Dr. Furman's like little like pear vinegar, pomegranate vinegar, like, and I finally finished it. Like it took me a long time. I kind of kept them forever because they were so cute in the cabinet, but I finally got through them all and they were all delicious. There was one that was odd. It was pecan, pecan balsamic, but it was delicious. It was the right thing. It was delicious. I thought they're all delicious. In fact, as you're making that, I'm thinking he has a lemon basil vinegar that I use as dressings. I mean, I also make a dressing like you. I keep dressing in the refrigerator all the time. But this lemon basil with fresh basils is delicious. Yummy. And it's a, it is a, it changes everything, right? It's like a good vinegar can change everything. So that's also worth spending some money on because it's just, it's the one place I feel like, oh, it's, you know, a little bit expensive, but it's worth it because it can last a long time. And as a rule, I don't have this here. I, I guess I didn't, I broke my own rule, but I usually write the date on everything. So I can then, once I'm out of it, I'm like, oh, I paid $10 for that, but it lasted nine months, Do you know? Like, and I probably used it 50 times. So I'm gonna make a little bit of noise. <laughs> Now, I did forget the little black pepper. I did want to get that in there. So I'm just going to take this off. And I'm going to taste it just to see how it is. Well, mm, it's delicious, of course. And it does, I want it to have a little black pepper. Just a little. But it's tangy. It's delicious. And you know, you always want to taste your dressing with the, with the green, right? You always want to dip it in and taste it. And that's when you... You want to taste your dressing always on the green. So you want to dip your green in and then say, oh, this needs this. And I'm just going to blend this. One. Okay, that's that. And then I have a really nice jar. I have a bunch of little jars that are called dressing jars. And we're just going to get rid of that. And where did my dressing jar go? Over here. And I just have this jar and I always label it. So this is strawberry cherry dressing and I put today's date on it so that we know when it was made. And then we just pour that in there. Now this will probably last me all this week and I'll eat it on other things. It's not just for this salad, right? But it is, good. it looks very beautiful, right? You can see it's kind of like a be a good dressing for Valentine's Day, right? Looks absolutely great. Carol, you have a question from the chat. Um, she says, wouldn't the four tablespoons of vinegar be a quarter cup total? Um, oh, yes, I added more. You were right. I, like, totally was doubling the recipe in my head. Oh, my gosh, she is so right. Thank you, viewer. She is right. Okay, Carrie Powers. So we should put a little more fruit in the dressing, but it's okay for now. It's a, It's okay. But 
in my head, I know I put, I did put the four, I was trying to make double, and I was thinking about that, and I didn't double the fruit, but I definitely doubled the vinegar, so the vinegar is doubled, so what I'll do later is I'll just, this is probably a half a cup, and I'll just puree this, I already got the, the thing dirty, let's just do it right this second, because we have a minute, and we can just get it rectified, thank you viewer. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I don't know if any of you know this, but I do bake for a living and I'm constantly doing multiplication things in my head. It's not a good place to do things, but sometimes I multiply things or de or I have things and I'm doing it in my head and it's not good because you really can make a mistake just like now when I thought it was making double. So what we're going to do is this is about a half a cup, I'm assuming. Let's just see. Let's just see. I know that I had the right amount of mustard in there for doubling earlier. So that's our half cup. That's why I took out all that food. I was wondering, why do I have extra food? But that's okay. And then we are going to get the lid. And uh, the lid is also dirty now. The great thing about not using oil and washing up by hand is so easy because everything cleans up fast. You know, there's no oil, there's nothing on your fingers, there's nothing on your towels. Oh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this back in here like that. Because, see, nobody's perfect. And thank goodness somebody knows what two tablespoons and two tablespoons is. That equals a quarter cup. <laughs> You know, it's good to know that math. Um, something that I, I, I don't think anyone practices unless you're in the field of cooking. But, you know, know how many tablespoons are in a cup, how many cups are in a gallon. Those are the kinds of math that I do in my head all the time, every day. So, yes, four tablespoons is definitely. And now this is thicker and better. And, of course, it's not all going to fit, but that's okay because we're gonna to toss the salad. So let's move this, and then let's get our little spatula. Let's get this out of the way. I like that we're, and we have to say hello to the quiche again inside the oven. <laughs> Wendy, we are really finishing up on time. Might be a new miracle for me. It's good. You're often on time. Um, I'm often running, rushing, and I'm not rushing, so that's good. It is one of my practices now that I'm not in New York City to not rush all the time. I used to be a rusher, now I'm not a rusher. So look, I, I put some, but it definitely needs more, right? And my little doggie's crying. I had to put her in the bedroom because she was, she, I, I tell you guys, she's so good all day. And then the minute I log on and say hello to Wendy and Jim, my dog starts crying because she sees I'm talking to somebody else. It's so crazy. So, so see, I'm really, I'm not, I wouldn't say there's quite a bit of dressing on the salad. I've really literally turned everything red. Can you, can you it's see? It's lovely. It looks so good. I, can only I mean, it's so fresh place. that I'm not kidding you. The other day I ate half of this salad by myself in one sitting. Okay, I was hungry. So good. It is perfect. It is absolutely perfect. I get a big, beautiful plate, and I've tossed it, and we're going to put it out. Wow. Carol, it really looks mouthwateringly delicious. It's really, really, really delicious, and it has a lot of different kinds of flavor. You, I mean, you definitely, the cherry and the strawberry, you definitely can taste, but you have the mint and the peas and the crunch. And mm -hmm. I, I'm telling you, it is, it's, it's just near perfect. And then the bitterness of the arugula. Is and the arugula has its own amazing. kind of spice, depending on how, how strong it is, right? But I really did choose arugula for a reason. It's because it has a very distinctive taste. And of course, if you wanted, you could chop a little more um, or, you know, if you wanted, you could put a big, beautiful piece of mint on top. Um, maybe not that big, not a whole stem, but you could put a 
piece on top just to signify. I always like topping things with the exact thing that's in it. But you could put a flower, you know, make it stand up like that. So it gorgeous like that. Absolutely gorgeous. Really. And I don't have any fresh pee. I mean, everything's dressed. And let's just go get the, the quiche and just see what's happening. We'll actually pull it out. It's not going to be done. But let's just see what's happening. Oh, it's getting there. Oh. And it's really hardening up. It really is. Wow. Can everybody see? And now, wow, wow, wow. So what is happening, and I'm kind of glad to take it out for you and show you this. I'm going to get a fork. And because it was so full, these didn't get really pressed in. So I'm going to give them a little pressing. <laughs> I really want them to be immersed. <laughs> it was only because our quiche pan was so, our pie pan was so full. I don't know. I made one cup of rice. It didn't happen last time, but, you know, things happen. Carol, the and design of that is just so pretty. I mean, it's gorgeous, and it looks so mouth-watering. And, some, you know, some of it has spilled to the edge, which is going to be problematic over there. But gorgeous. there, now I've kind of pushed them all in. And the last, it's been in a half an hour, and it really needs at least, I think it's 45 minutes, I say, 45, yeah, 45 minutes until the top starts to get light brown. And what will happen is I'll put a little bit, a tent of foil, put a tent of foil for the last very five minutes or 10 minutes. Again, your oven, everyone oven is totally different. So it might be that you need to tent it earlier because you have a hot oven, but you do want this to get brown before you tent it. And the only reason for tenting it is you don't want the rice edges to get too crispy, right? Otherwise they're gonna just be kind of brown and. I mean, there's nothing wrong with crispy rice. I actually like crispy rice, but you want to, so let this get brown and then make sure that it's not jiggling anymore. And this is pretty much almost all set up already. You see, nothing's happening when I'm jiggling it around. You can see. It is so, beautiful. This is going to go back to the oven for a few minutes, but I just want to, I'll leave it here just for a minute so people can ask their questions, but it will go back into the oven and then I will have it for dinner tonight. But again, remember to let it cool uh, enough. It will be warm, won't be piping hot, but before you go starting to cut it, because you do, it will cut into real pie pieces, slices, because it's densely layered with the mushrooms, then the onions, and then the custard. And the custard is also running through the bottom, right? So the custard's running through the whole thing. So it, it will be delicious. It all looks incredible. The design looks incredible. The colors, the flavors. Um, you're getting comments. It all looks so delicious. Can't wait to make them. Thanks, Chef Carol. Mm -hmm. Carol, Car our friend Carol from Maryland is online. Oh, hi, Carol. <laughs> She's saying looks gorgeous. And Carrie says everything looks so beautiful and delicious. So you're getting a lot of raves here, um, Carol. Looks Does anyone beautiful. have any questions? I feel like today was no questions. Like, I it, don't know. I mean, very, for me, it was very riveting. Um, and Carol says hello back. Um, no questions so far. I mean, other than the pot and, you know, a few, a few that we handled in between. Um, okay, then, then that's really it. And just remember that this is a whole grain crust, right? So that's awesome to not be having any kind of pie dough or any kind of flour. This would satisfy a gluten-free uh, uh, person in any, in any time. Uh, well, my daughter loved arranging asparagus, it says. Oh, my gosh. And he's dubious of the arugula. <laughs> I love that. Someone has to write to me. That person has to write to me and tell me if they loved it so much. Exactly. Oh, and that's Claudine. She's going to come over. She's literally down the street. Oh, she, how marvelous. Yes, I, I got to see her. very. I, yes, not very many people in New Mexico watch me, but Claudine, I, I love her children so much. I mean, I love Claudine too, the mom, but it's fun because she has kids and um, I get to teach them baking sometimes after school and so cooking. Sweet. So it is something that I love doing very much. Because You're getting a couple of questions. And then um, for those of you who can hang out for the, the 
announcements and such, but two questions. Can you freeze the tart after you cook it? And how does it last in the fridge? And um, I had it last in the fridge for the whole week because right. I'm again, one person and I was only eating a slice at a time. I don't know about freezing it, but I don't see why not. <laughs> I really, I don't see why not, but I, 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 I don't know. I don't know because I haven't done it. Um, but Claudine, probably, I don't see a reason why you couldn't. Um, yeah, I don't see why. Yeah, but I don't know if I would because it's so fresh. <laughs> you know, I, there's a lot of things that I'm not. I'm not against the freezer for sure, especially for those families that are having to like you know save time, right? But I did tell you you could save time by getting a bag of frozen sliced mushrooms and using those and. There's, there's ways around it. You could make the filling really a day ahead of time, right? And the rice, you want it to be warm. And so it's still kind of sticky a little bit. And you want to make sure you use the short grain rice. Very good. And then Claudine just asked if you use the tamari, which you did use. In I did. I used it inside the with the tofu and the turmeric and the onion powder in the, in the blender and the plant-based milk. So it was a it was two two teaspoons wherever it was. It's definitely used because the thing is in the sink. Carol, I'm gonna jump back into the announcements. This was an incredible show. Perfect, perfect, perfect for springtime. Asparagus, onions, mushroom tart. I mean, I can't wait. And the salad looks amazing. So um, bravo. Okay. While you do your closing announcements, I'm gonna get it back in the oven. Okay. Very good. Just thinking maybe it will get done. Very, very good. So um, all of you, thank you again for joining us here at Plant Powered Metro New York. And I think that this was co-sponsored by the uh, Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. A um, couple events coming up tomorrow night in Harlem. We have a movie night. Cowspiracy will be playing at 545. It's in person. Please register. Uh, we have a plant-powered potluck in downtown Brooklyn. We're definitely doing more in-person meet and greets. Um, and April 18th, let's go shopping for health. Jim, our wonderful, amazing producer, who, by the way, just won a award at Plant Powered Metro New York's anniversary, our grassroots award, I believe, um, at the Queens Public Library. So uh, let's go shopping for health. That sounds absolutely great. We have walks going on. Part of this plant-based lifestyle or Whole Foods lifestyle is um, moving, exercise. So we have a walk on April 20th in Central Park in Manhattan, in Astoria Park in Queens, and in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, all 10 to 12 um, morning on those dates. And then uh, we have a book club. Uh, you can all join us online. We're going to be reading The China Study, which is, of course, a seminal book that um, has a lot of the science of why eating, uh, science and stories of why eating uh, primarily plants is such a uh, healthy thing to do, and that's free online. And then uh, May 1st, I highly recommend you register for our webinar, also online, Nourish Your Mind. It's a meal prep and shopping for cognitive resilience. And this is going to cover the role of nutrition in preventing and also dealing with um, neurological conditions like Alzheimer's and um, Parkinson's and just keeping your brain really healthy, particularly as we age. So please join us for that. That's at noon to one. So it's a, it's not in the evening, East Coast time. Um, and then check the website. There are other events coming up in May. Our next class with Carol will be uh, Sunday, May 18th. And let me just see if there's anything else. Yeah, anybody, please join us for all of our events if you live in the area or online. And um, the links to register are all on our Plant Powered Metro New York website. If you can, um, all of our events are free, but if you're able to, please do make a donation, particularly this month or last month. March was really our anniversary, but we're um, continuing a bit of a fundraising drive for our upcoming programs um, in the course of the next year. Carol can be reached at um, carol at the veggie vanguard.com. 
And um, Plant Power Metro, of course, you've got our, our events. And let me just see if there's anything else. Yeah, a huge thank you to Jim Spellos, who is our producer. The show would not be what it is without him. And to Alan Smithy, um, David Bowles for his contributions, and then to the entire team at Plant Power Metro New York. So on behalf of Cooking with Chef Carol team, we're reminding you to eat your fruits, veggies, and nuts, and beans, and seeds, and to stay healthy. And back to Carol. Anything else? Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Carol, as always, for being here. Wendy and Jim and David also, and for consulting. And um, I always thank the team because I couldn't do it without them. And um, thank you to the JCC for being part of our sponsor and for all of you that come from the JCC. It's uh, uh, my home away from home. So it's a place that's dear to my heart. And I wish I was in Central Park doing a 5K mile walk with you all. Um, I wish all of you Chag Sameach that celebrate Passover. Um, I don't know, the two holidays have passed each other like boats. Uh, Easter and Passover have been, <laughs> will be almost a month apart from each other. But I do wish everyone a good Passover and I will see you all in May. <laughs> And, and, oh, and if you want, you could add spring onions or chives to the salad. Okay, I was thinking about spring so much, and that is another thing that comes out of the spring onions. But chives or any kind of scallions would be lovely in the salad, too. Sounds so, good. Okay. There are lots of people I know that pick out onions from salads, so I purposely tried to make a salad without onions. And Isla says... Hi, and eat your veggies, too, because she does, too. I'm sure Isla also can appreciate a good walk. Carol and I met, and all this kind of started on a walk. So um, for <laughs> any of you who want to join us walking, please do. <laughs> and otherwise, enjoy walking in your neighborhood. Okay, <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Take Thank care. you.